Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this room for the afternoon. Um, considering the topic of the talk we have uh, as the first talk for this afternoon, I think it's a good idea to start on time. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Daniel for RTLA Timer Lat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Daniel. I work for Red Hat for quite, quite a while. I'm, I mostly work on the upstream on kernel in things related to real time, runtime verification and scheduling and so on. <coughs> and so this is about a, a tool that is inside the, the kernel, the set of kernel tools <coughs> that is time lot as a tool inside RTLA. <coughs> so here we have been talking a lot about real time Linux, uh, even with Dion's presentation this morning. So uh, Linux has been used as a real-time operating system, right? It, it, it's a fact. Many people might say it's not a real-time operating system because of, uh, of uh, it's a large operating system because of uh, general purpose nature, but Linux is able to deliver uh, reasonable good timing behavior. And, uh, and many people are looking for Linux as a real-time operating system option because the, the stack of software is increasing, people are using AI stack and video processing and all these accelerators, and, and these technologies have been developed using Linux as the default operating system. So there's a huge advantage of continuing using Linux on these setups. <coughs> and so people look at Linux as a viable option as a RTOS, also because there are many people that understand it, hopefully. And, uh, and as I said, also because Linux achieves the, the desired timing behaviors. And, and some of the key features for this is like the fully preemptive mode, which is the preemptor T kernel, the, the real time scheduling, locking, and so on. Uh, one of the problems, however, <clears throat> when we try to say that Linux is a real time operating system is the way that we show these, these properties, right? Because Linux has been tested using a, a black box like method and when you start talking with people that uh, run real-time systems on critical systems they might say okay black box is it's it gives me that the number but it doesn't gives me why that number happened and how i can debug it and how can i explain if we if that's a bad scenario or not <coughs> so um, the way the way that uh, these black box tools work like cyclic test is that they they arm a timer in the future using an external clock reference. And then when this timer happened, the, the, high, the highest priority thread is awakened. And when this thread starts running, it reads the time again and measures this latency. <coughs> That's the basic idea. So the basic, we cannot say that this approach doesn't work, right? <coughs> because we have been developing the, the preemptor T doing things this way and the results are good. So yeah, it, <coughs> it, uh, it it works. It's just that it gives no root cause analysis. It doesn't and doesn't <coughs> and, and, and doesn't do that that step that next step, right? And generally, for us, when we are working uh, in the kernel, when we see a latency, what we do is we use we use tracing uh, features, right? <coughs> we go there. I, I've been working this for quite a while. I already know by uh, by the top of my head, what are the events that I need to enable? I, I just say, okay, enable this, this, this event, and then give me the trace, and I will try to analyze it. And uh, but but trace is not always accessible for for let's say the non-experts like my project manager, right? Like my manager, <coughs> and when they see a new bugzilla at Red Hat saying, oh, there is this latency and this number, right? They always need to get someone, some expert involved to try to to debug the problem. And also, uh, after their 10 years uh, doing this kind of r repetitive ritual, one gets annoyed, right? I was annoyed, right? And so, oh, do this, do that, and do that. Oh, yet again, the same, the same, uh, the same ritual. <laughs> so, who cares about this anyway? So, uh, other than the, the poor dude doing tracing like me, other than me, who cares? So, w one of the points is that. There is a, an, an, I would say, even incredible for, for if we look like 10 years ago, if we, we think the number of use cases that we have for real time nowadays and the request for Red Hat and for, for the upstream, it, it's impressive. Many people are using real time Linux, like in telecommunications and now in the ELISA project for safety critical. So there is a, a large demand for, for the real time kernel. And, uh, and uh, as, as the kernel gets merged, there's also a fact that 
uh, all the kernel developers will have to start testing for regressions uh, on the real-time kernel because the real-time kernel will be part of the regular kernel. So, uh, but not 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 all of them are interested on on learning the details of the kernel, the real-time kernel and synchronization, right? If I am the, the, the video for Linux uh, maintainer I, and there is a regression, I, I, I will talk to someone that is expert on, on real-time, not necessarily <coughs> the, the expert on another field in the kernel. The kernel is huge. <coughs> and also, that there is a lot of projects, as I said, that, that, uh, that require this real-time, like automotive and automation, to, to name a few, uh, telecommunications and so on. <coughs> so, what is Timerlot? The RTLA, uh, Timerlot, is a new approach for that. So, the RTLA is actually a test suite that is inside the kernel source that has a lot of tools inside. Timerlot is one tool inside of RTLA. So, RTLA is a new approach that tries to, to integrate all the bits and pieces that I use on the bugging, that we use on the bugging. Uh, <coughs> so, in, in one side we have, in the kernel side, we have a tracer, that is the timer lot tracer, that uh, contains the, it does the in-kernel processing for, for the timer, and adds a set of OS noise trace points that we'll see later, that does uh, most of the processing in kernel, or some of the processing in kernel, to reduce the overhead on tracing, and try to write just processed information to the trace buffer, and it, it uses lockless synchronization to avoid like false positives and so on. And, uh, and it also has an in, in kernel workload that simulates that uh, black box uh, tooling. And uh, if you are interested on the details of the lockless synchronization and the noise reduction, there is a paper published at uh, IEEE Transactions on Computers that is about another tracer, this is a, a sibling tracer, that is the OS noise tracer. But the trace points are the same and the idea is the same. So you can find a lot of information here. <coughs> and so that's the, the kernel part and we can use it using the, the TraceFS interface. Together, here I say I put libtracefs, so I, I use the libtracefs to glue this kernel part with a user space side. That, uh, that, that gives us a, a tool that's timer lot that tries to bring a, 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 tries to give to that tracer a benchmark-like interface, trying to make it easy to use. It sets up the trace, it collects the data, parse the data, and, and gives us some output that I'll show later. And it also allows us to have some auto-analysis for bad values, and I'll discuss this also later. And gives the possibility of running the uh, uh, workload in user space. That's something that's, that hopefully will show up in this near future on kernel. <coughs> so, before starting, uh, there is one thing. Because I, I'm in kernel, I'm controlling the timer. The timer lot, it, uh, it already breaks that latency metric into two metrics. So it has a special IRQ handler that is activated, and when it's activated, I measure the the IRQ latency. This IRQ will wake up the thread, and then the thread latency will be printed later. So instead of one, it's starting to break it down, but instead of having one metric, it, it shows already two metrics. And it <coughs> so here is one example of the two output. Uh, this is my system like five years ago. I'm running, it's, it's a regular workstation. It has 24 CPUs, I'm running one on, I'm running kernel compiling on all the CPUs, that's the, this terminal here, and here I'm trying to use the tool. So RTLA timer lot top will give a, a top-like interface that will show me the latency that my system is facing now. So here I have the, the, the CPUs, the amount, how many cycles, my current IRQ latency, the minimum, the average latency, the maximum latency for the IRQ, that wakes up the thread, and here's my current, the minimum, the average latency, and the maximum latency. So it's already giving some, some two-stage information here. This is the top uh, interface. There is the histogram interface that gives us a, a histogram of the system. It does the same thing, but instead of keep displaying, it runs in silence and uh, it collects the histograms, and when I either hit Ctrl C or say run this for one hour, at the end it prints a summary of the output. And here it is, so let me just pause here, maybe it's better. So here is the latency and how many occurrences I had on that latency. So as you can see, we can see here 
this is the RQ latency. It's shorter. It happens more close to this time. This is the thread latency. It goes longer and it, it, it spreads more. So this is useful for, for analysis or for regression analysis. And there's a lot of options for me to format here to make it easier to, to be parsed by, by scripts. Let me <coughs> so this is just to show an idea of what is the test. Uh, what happens is that when we are testing the system, we, have, we generally have a maximum uh, acceptable latency or, or a threshold. And if that threshold is, it's generally in microseconds, right? So, <clears throat> and when this threshold is, uh, uh, a latency occurrence goes uh, beyond that threshold, it's interesting for us to try to understand why it happens, so why my system is not within my limits, right? <clears throat> so TimerNAT allows us to set a variable on the command line that says, okay, if, if a large latency happens, please stop everything. Then I can say, oh, if the thread latency was higher than 100, stop, or if IRQ latency were higher the, than 100, stop. Or there is a, a magic option that is the dash A that enables all the default uh, things that uh, an expert would enable, just an easy shot. So uh, dash A 100, it will enable if you thread, if IRQ, get the stack trace, enable the tracing, and so on. I, I use it a lot. I just put my defaults there, and uh, hopefully people will like it. Suggestions are welcome. <clears throat> so, when the system stops, TimerLot not only stops tracing and collects the trace, it also prints an auto-analysis of the root cause for that, uh, for that spy. Oops, so that Daniel from the past was faster than Daniel from now. So, I'm saying dash A30, stop if there is a latency higher than 30. <clears throat> Brum. And here the tracing is stopped. And and here we can see there is, okay, an expert would say, okay, there's this IRQ disabled, that's maybe the problem, but you can see here that there is now a variable that's IRQ latency delay, IRQ latency, the duration of my IRQ, which was the task that was running, and this task running was this one, and uh, this uh, a suspicious call, and so on. And uh, don't worry, I will explain this future. That, that's the subject of the talk. It's explaining how to read this report. So, and my latency was this one, and and, and yeah, it, it it gives this hopefully easy to read output, or, or as easy as we can get for now. <coughs> so, next. Auto-analysis. How, how do I analyze the auto-analysis output? How do I read it? <coughs> so the auto-analysis tries to decompose the latency into a set of variables. Not one number, not two numbers, but a series of numbers somehow independent that compose the latency. And each of these values can be analyzed mostly independently. And, uh, and when we see like an IRQ latency or a thread latency, they have different ways to be analyzed because an IRQ has a different uh, priority or follow different rules than threads, right? And, uh, and the auto, and it's important to say the auto analysis here, even though it is probably most people using parameter T will use this tool, it works for all kernels, for the non-preemptive as well. There is even a, one example, so it's generic. I try to abstract the, the, the concepts to, to make it uh, as generic as possible. <coughs> so the timer latitude used some abstractions that we use from, that we have on RT theory. I like the RT theory, many people doesn't, but I do. And uh, so we have there the execution time, which is the time to accomplish a task. For example, if my RQ handler executes for 10 microseconds and I need it to accomplish my task, this is the execution time of it. Blocking happens when a lower priority task uh, postpones the execution of the higher higher priority task. That's blocking. The interference is the contrary, is when a higher priority thread preempts a lower priority thread. So blocking, low priority, uh, interference, high priority. Uh, when we think on tasks on Linux, we generally think on threads, right? But if, if we look in the internals of the kernel, <coughs> uh, in, internally in the kernel, it, it's easy to see that we have like four classes 
of uh, tasks. If you want to see the prem, like how, how many parameters we can have inside the trace buffer, we have these four abstractions here. One thing that can prompt the other. So the rule is somehow like this. We have NMIs that can prompt every, every kind of task and, and cannot be prompted. Uh, we have IRQs that prompt all but NMIs. And uh, we have software queues that can be prompted from IRQs and NMIs, but cannot be prompted by tasks. And, and, tra and threads that can prompt themselves, but cannot prompt the others. If we read backwards, we can see threads can cause block into software queues. Software queues and threads can cause block into IRQs, and, and, and nothing can block NMI. Sorry. Oh, other than other NMIs. <laughs> Sorry? Or bugs, yeah, bug scans. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't like to hear bugs on NMI code. <laughs> like NMI preempting NMI is never good. So let's get one example here. Oops. Let's get one example here. Uh, an IRQ latency examples. Let's focus on the first part first. Uh, so I set my latency to 30. It stopped on the 50 on threads. And uh, yeah. <coughs> oh, I, I also draw a timeline here to make it easier to visualize. Um, so, the RQ handler here, the RQ handler, it's, it, it had a 31 microseconds delay from starting. So, this was the time where the, the hardware interrupt was set to run, and it took 31 microseconds until it started running. <coughs> uh, and the RQ latency was 32.17 microseconds, boom. That, that was the fastest time I could read the timer and report it. Um, the blocking thread, th that is the thread that could have postponed it, it was this object. And here is the, the, the part in, it's, uh, it's the IRQ handler itself. So just from, from here is the IRQ handler, from here is the task. Uh, so we can see here that there is this function, IRQ restore, that re-enables the interrupts. So it makes sense, there was a thread that disabled interrupts. That's why my interrupt was uh, postponed. And then we can see here that it was inside the ButterFS and the VFS write. And then I see here, why, why is this C group R stat flush locked, uh, call it the, the raw spin lock, right? I can just do a git blame on kernel and try to figure out the patch. In this case, it's a legitimate use case because the person sending is, is the Prem30 maintainer, Sebastian. Right? So there is a reason for it to be there. What one can do is try to optimize the code inside there to reduce it, or try to make this workload not run on that CPU that I care. But this is a legit case, and I could connect the code with the analysis. And also, we learned that this use case has this signature, if there is another bug with this signature, my PM can say, hmm, this smells like that the other bug, duplicate. Hey, let's work for that. Well, that's not a, a point in time that's interesting to have less work, but that's another discussion. Uh, another, another thing that Ian mentioned uh, on his presentation about having the, the AZX from idle latency, right? On, and here you, I have one example of exit from idle latency. Uh, in the theory, there's this uh, release jitter term that's basically this. It's, so IRQ delayed, there, the IRQ can be also delayed from hardware because of factors in hardware. And I'll talk more about it later, but there is this special case when, when the system doesn't have like exit from idle tuned. And there is also, he mentioned the, the tune, the profiles that Red Hat that can help on that. but. Here's a system that the, the C states aren't configured. The latency on the RQ handler, it took like 39 microseconds. The system is running the, the swapper thread, which is idle, and the analysis already say, okay, this is the exit from idle. This, this, this is the, the problem here. You need to check this. And it also mentioned, okay, over the analysis, I also saw that my largest delay was this amount in exit from a idle light latency. Even if the cause that made the system stop wasn't this, it would print at the end because that's a, a common limitation. So when uh, TimerLat has a option to, that seems like that, that has an option to work around it, but the, the real thing that one needs to do is, is set up the C states. So going further, <coughs> one, one example of thread uh, latency. 
here it's harder to get thread, thread delay examples on prem 30 because it, it's running well so i went to the regular kernel and that's why i took the regular kernel but i can say also well i just wanted to show that it also works on the non-preemptive non kernel so <coughs> here we have an example where the the irq handler delay it was zero it was some nanosecond so okay that's good it's not a problem of delay in the irq let me see if i had an animation or not yes i did so uh, the timer out irq uh, the, the IRQ latency from timer lat was one microsecond. It's okay. It's just the time to pip up. And the, the timer lat IRQ, it, the execution time of it, it was like 9, 9.5 microseconds. And there is also one interference that is while the blocking thread was running, it also suffered some sort of interference. That is, other IRQs happened. So the, uh, the timer IRQ, another timer IRQ happened. Uh, a software queue, two software queues happened, and we can see here. Also, the migration thread was dispatched on that CPU, and we can see the amount, but they are not that relevant, right? It's 0 0.75%, 1%. It, it's not a big thing. The big thing was a key worker thread blocking, a key worker thread blocked by 500 microseconds. And here we can see that it was, again, I'm not against ButterFS, right? It's just that I use ButterFS, and I'm getting the, the example there, and I do like ButterFS. So ButterFS people, I like you. I use on all my system. That's why they are here. <laughs> it's just that you know, here we are running on the non-real-time kernel, so we have the preemption points inside the kernel. And it's normal to have this preemption disabled. It's like if preemption is disabled by default and there are points in which you check if there is something to, to be rescheduled. So here, what one could do is, okay, inside this code, I could go there and try to put more preemption points, more count rescat, count rescat, count rescat, to try to reduce the latency for the no preemptive kernel. Or, or if you have like the, 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 the preemptive kernel, but not the, the, the preemptive RT. Why would one li would like to run that, that, that case? Because they do not want to have the overheads of the, uh, the real-time locking, for example. It, Ubuntu has the, the low latency kernel, it runs like that. So one could go there and optimize this use case. It's not uh, black and white, let's say, in the, in the sense here that um, you need preemptivity for everything. You can tune the non-real-time kernel. And the tool also works for that. So, okay. Real-time, the RTLA has its roots on tracing, right? It, the tra it has a tracer, and it's done by people who like tracing. And so it's natural for it to have also interface for the tracing things. So as it acts as the, the RTLA, timer is a front end for the timer lot tracer. By the way, all the documentation here for the tracer and for RTLA, there are on the kernel documentation. You, you can go there and read the main page and everything. So uh, the, the timer lot can enable the OS and noise trace points, and they report the amount of time that each task run on the kernel. And, uh, and, and it gives you a number, and I'll explain the number, it's, it's easy to read. And so we have one trace point for each kind of task. So there is the NMI, the NMI noise, the RQ noise, software RQ and threads. Then we are connected with those blockings and, and interference. And these values that they report, they report a, a, the amount of time in nanoseconds. This value is already free from interference. For example, if I have a thread running blocking and an interrupt happens, the amount that time that the, this interrupt run is already discounted from the execution time of the blocking. So I don't need to look, when I see the blocking time, I don't need to try to reinterpret it to, oh, this, I need to discount this value because there is an IRQ and blah, blah, blah. This value is already readable. It's 10, it's 10, it discounted everything. So it, it, it avoids us having to look back and trace and look back and trace and get back and forth, back and forth. So here's one example of timer lot uh, an autoanalysis and tracing all together. So run the autoanalysis, stop with 30 on, only on the CPU 4, and boom, it stopped. Here is, we can have a look at the analysis. The Daniel from the past will probably click on the something. Daniel from four years ago, yes. So in this, this is the, 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 the point where the, inter or the preemption was disabled. 
and go video. Okay, you see there's this function there. So I'm doing tail on the trace file that's automatically saved. And here we have the, the ftrace output, the, the tracing output. By default, it's only enabled, oh, see, this is the RQ latency. And uh, this is the amount of noise that the blocking thread gave. And it has the starting time and the duration. How long the RQ run? This is all my latency. So I can read it here as well. If I wanted to go deeper and, 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 and trying to read the auto analysis from the trace because, because of things that we will see now. Uh, okay, let's see. No, Luis, it's not public yet. So that's the problem of using chat in presentation. It's Luis Claudio, is a colleague. So the RTLA timer not can also be used or can also be used to enable other uh, tracing features. So I can use all the tracing events on the kernel starting by the timer not interface. And, uh, and here is the options. I can enable feature, enable events, run features and triggers. Here is a video. So I, I, I wanted to say run, stop on 30, and stop if SCAD, uh, SCAD work queue, SCAD RQ, vectors, IRQ, and run. So the thread will stop. And if I see here the um, go ahead, then from past. If I look at the trace file there, it will show. Okay, then from past is trying to explain. No, then we need to run faster. It's here. Okay, here's the, the the trace output. I just read that same file, and here I can see I can see the trace point the. I can see like SCAD waking, SCAD wake up, local timer. These are the events that I enabled via the command line. So I can use them. So timer not tries to avoid or, or tries to reduce the amount of time that you will go into that direction, going deeper in tracing. But it also allows you, it doesn't block you to go into there. So one can always go deeper and deeper and deeper as much as one can or like. And, and there is even more things. We can even go further into the tracing because there's a lot of options that we can do in tracing. So for example, we can use the tracing histograms to get all the interference that the IRQ gave on my system and have all the interference that software IQ had on my system to check them at the beginning. Because as, as the, the timer out, or like that, they work by sampling, it might be the case that there was an interrupt that was very long, but it was just not uh, at the same time that the timer was fired. So there could have been a longer latency that I didn't catch. But with the OS noise trace points and the histograms, we can have a look on that. So he, uh, I will paste one histogram line, they are here, right? So now you see why I, I posted the link. So this page, and I have this command line. That's why I placed the reference there because I don't, I cannot memorize it. And I paste it on my site just because of this, because I need to check it. So I'm enabling timer lot and say, create my histograms for the IRQs and display the, the IRQ name on the CPU. How many of them took 10 microseconds? And then it shows a, a histogram. Same for IRQs, same for software IRQs. And now the timer lot is running. It has these histograms running in the background. And when the trace stops, it will automatically save those files. And this works for any histograms. If there is a histogram that was enabled, Timerlat will save the histogram file. So here, let's see how many, oh, my system has NMIs. And I wasn't expecting actually. And my system has NMIs and I can see how many times they took. So they are generally on the nine to 10 microseconds. So my latency can be at least 10 microseconds because an NMI can happen. So then the RQ noise, I can see all the RQs that happen on the given CPU, like here the CPU, CPU 1, 2. Here you can see the pattern going to 12, 17, and going down, you can see the pattern. 
But look at this. I wasn't expecting this either when I run. The next one, here. There is a timer I argue that took 32 microseconds. So my latency is bounded to be at least 32 microseconds on my system. Always, because there is an RQ that takes at least 32 microseconds. And I know that there is an NMI that can take at least 10 microseconds. So I can have a 40 microsecond latency on my system. Even, even if I didn't have one example here, if it didn't stop. So I can start doing this reasoning. If we keep doing this reasoning, we will reach on another tool. That is the one I presented on 2020 that uh, shows the worst case latency that tries to compose these things. It will be part of the timer lot, it's just not yet because it depends on, on some optimizations that you have to do on the preempt and, and IRQ disabled trace points. And those trace points aren't enabled by default on distros. Once we can get man once we can get a way to have those trace points enabled by default, because it if we reduce the the, the overhead, we can have these other tracer enabled and I can try to ask the, it for merge. Uh, there is one feature that is hopefully will be part of the kernel in the future that is now the workloads in the kernel but people say that I would like to see it in kernel in user space and there is a, a feature hopefully on the way for this so instead of having the the user space the cur in kernel workload we have a user space workload that uses an uh, interface provided by the timer lot uh, and, uh, okay, I, w I think I'm running out of time. I, I just need to run. So here's one example of this option. It will be enabled with uh, just a flag, the timer lot dash u. And so instead of having two metrics, now I have uh, three metrics. The IRQ, the thread, and after pinging back in the user space. So it goes to user space, and if it goes straight to the kernel, it shows the latency or the execution time of going to user space and, and, and returning. Uh, these data will be larger also because now as we increase the window, we can have more chance of having interference. And that's why thinking on this abstraction is easier for us to communicate. And uh, we can also have histograms. And uh, this interface is exposed to user space. I can use my, my own tool to use that interface. And then I can read this number as the response time for my task to be awakened, started running, run my computation, and then go back. And the auto analysis will also hopefully work so I can see the response time of my, of my task have this amount of interference and this amount of blocking. And, this, and there are more things on the way that uh, I would. Some by the ways when trying to figure out the the, the latency, right? Okay, the timer lot has these these options. I can set a different period, a different set of CPUs, how long I want to, to my session to run. I can set priority saying like, I want my thread to be SCAD deadline, not uh, SCAD FIFO. All right, I would like to test if my, a non-real-time task, just to see how much inter interference a non-real-time task would run. There is, uh, uh, we can, we will have functions, uh, this is under development, I say, uh, I want to run on this CPU my collection, uh, the MI latency that I mentioned. Uh, I, I don't want to collect, uh, I don't want to collect the trace, the, the, the numbers. I just want a report if it stops. Like if I have a huge system and I would like to have a, a very fine grained uh, period. That would cause my RTLA try to run too long, and, but I'm not interested. I just want to see if it stops and print me a, a, a report. This dump task is important when you have uh, the latency induced by another thread. So for example, like Onion presented. So you have things running on another CPU causing pollution on the cache, and my thread is running here, and it's stopping, and my system was idle. So what could have been? It displays what was running on the other CPUs for me to get a hint of what is causing me the indirect delay. And, uh, and by the way, there's another tool, uh, RTLA is a, is a set of tools, and there's one tool which is the hardware noise that measures this case when the hardware has some kind of latency, for example, SMIs or bus locking, that ends up creating latency on my, on my thread latency. Because if my hardware has latencies, it will also postpone my thread latency. So here's an example of the output, I will pause here. So my period, it, uh, it, on each period, 
like each second period, it tried to run for 75% of the time. And on each of these periods, the total of noise that my hardware noise received was this amount. So I'm having this amount of CPU time net from the hardware noise. Uh, each of these cycles, in one cycle I have uh, 18, it was the maximum. And uh, this 18 was composed for at least two because my max single noise was 13 microseconds. I can see here also that there were hardware noise and NMI caused noise. This is the a way to, the, the, the thing on the back here is the OS noise tracer with IRQ is disabled. So now I'm saying, okay, I would like to stop the trace if I see a hardware latency larger than 15 and I would like to see the, and I would like to see the NMI trace points. Right, I would like to check the trace. So it, it stopped and then I see the trace. And here I can see, oh, there is a sample threshold for 15 microseconds. And while it was running, I'm sure that there was an NMI because this is interference is one. I'm, I'm sure that it is one because of the lockless uh, synchronization that I have on kernel that ensures me that this was one. There, between the time I read here and here, just one thing happened, it was this NMI. So the NMI noise and, the, and if I want to remove them, I need to check why is this perf event NMI handler running here before I'm, I'm going deeper on the, the analysis. And um, so final remarks. Uh, Timernet integrates the workload tracing out analysis all in a single tool and it tries to produce a, a summary with root, root cause that can be hopefully read by my project manager without having to call me. But <laughs> the idea is also to speed up the, the way like, for example, uh, a person that is not from RT testing the, their subsystem in kernel, they saw that they have a regression. How do I report this to the real time people for them to give me a hand? Boom, just one one output. And, uh, and the tool also allows the usage of, of more advanced in tracing and we will more and more integrate those things with, with, with Steven's libraries like trace command. And uh, the, RT is the, the RTLA is the home of folder tools for analysis. We have the timer lot, the OS noise that measures the interference only, the hardware noise that I showed, but it can only get better, right? Uh, I'm working on a tracer that shows the execution time of the tasks using those trace points. Uh, there is this tool that I mentioned that, that shows the worst case uh, analysis with a formal proof and uh, it, it, it will be placed inside of RTLA. I'm working with Paolo Bonzini and, uh, and Francesco, a student in Milan, uh, to integrate the timer lot and OS noise with KVM so I can see if there was an, a noise on my system, instead of saying it was hardware, I would be able to say if it was either hardware it could be hardware, right? Or it could have been the host that preempted the vCPU. And we will be able to show those things. And uh, so it can only get better because the tool was thinking on that way. Uh, and whatever the community needs, uh, the, the more tools we can, we are able to put there, the better. I've, I've made a script. Before writing the presentation, I, I wrote like a script of this will be my presentation. So we have a how-to like of this presentation here. And uh, I just placed online today. And that's it, questions? We have time for a few questions. Um, so from what I understood, you have the ability to identify the difference between the hardware latency and an NMI latency. Uh, is this taken into account for the auto-analysis or will unexplained latencies be attributed always to NMIs? No, when, when there is those trace points, right, that I see when an NMI happened or when an IRQ happened or when a thread happened. If none of these trace points happen between two reds of the time, it was nothing inside the operating system. So we can say that it was in the hardware. So when you see there was the, that trace point, there was this trace point here. Mm, no. 
that it says one. When it says zero, there was nothing happened on the operating system level, so it was something on the hardware. And that's where we, would, uh, we could extend saying, okay, if there is nothing here in the hardware, can I check with KVM if there was something? Then KVM can give it. And we can extend for other things as well. Any more questions? Apparently not, so thank oh, you very much. Well, good, so the, uh, I, will, I will go home thinking that the output is good enough for people not to have questions. Thank you, Daniel, thank you.